Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Martin Andrews. I am the Communications Director at Inquire Ed and we welcome you here today to tell me more using diverse books and inquiry to teach history. This webinar is part of our series, Building Background Knowledge, Literacy, Democracy, and Community, and we only have one more left. And that is, what can a citizen do? It's an interview with Dave Eggers and Sean Harris. They created this wonderful children's book, What Can a Citizen Do? And we're gonna to talk to them about their motivations. We're gonna to talk to them about their experience. And we're going to have some teachers on and they're going to talk, tell us about how they're using the book in the class or how they're uh, inspiring their students to take informed action and impact their communities. This webinar series is brought to you by the National Council for the Social Studies and Inquire Ed. Now, NCSS is the largest professional organization in the country dedicated to social studies education. They bring you the best educational programming available. You should explore their current webinar series and Summer Institute because, you know, summer is coming soon. I know that's an exciting prospect for you educators out there. Um, you can check out what they have to offer at socialstudies.org slash professional dash learning. And you can find out about the webinars coming up as well as those summer institutes. The webinar series is also brought to you by Inquire Ed. Inquire Ed has created inquiry journeys to move social studies instruction beyond the textbook, supporting culturally responsive instruction, inquiry-based teaching and learning, connecting to high quality and diverse sources and content. And now you can actually sign up for a free trial for our K through five curriculum. And you can do that at inquireed.org slash free dash trial. So please do that if you would like to take a look at what an inquiry based elementary social studies looks like. Right now, I would like to introduce uh, Melissa Marks. And Melissa, if you can turn your camera on now, that would be great. Um, Melissa is the director of the educational program at the University of Pittsburgh Greensburg. Her books include Teaching About Diversity, Activities to Start the Conversation, and How to Talk to Families About Child and Adolescent Mental Illness, co-authored with Dr. Diane Marsh. She was awarded the Pennsylvania Association of College Teachers of Education Teacher Educator of the Year Award, the Pitt Greenberg Distinguished Teaching Award, and the University of Pittsburgh Chancellor's Award for Distinguished Teaching, among others. Prior to teaching at the college level, she taught social studies to middle school students for 10 years. Melissa, thanks so much for joining us. I'm really, I'm really glad to be here and good afternoon to everyone. I appreciate you being with us. Um, I, I don't know if the weather is as nice everywhere that you are, but the fact that you're here with me instead of outside makes me feel very happy. So thank you. <laughs> So, Melissa, I'm going to turn this over to you. I'm going to drive the deck. So you just tell me where when you need to uh, for me to go forward. And then I'll also be in the chat. Um, so if anybody wants to pose any questions, I can take those questions out of the chat and uh, and bring them up to Melissa. So, Melissa, uh, uh, all over to you now. So like all teachers are supposed to do, um, I want to give you an overview of what we're doing today. Specifically, um, we're going to be looking at what were you taught and what do you know? We're going to look at what does the research say about different books in the classrooms. We're going to look at a couple of different activities. What activities can we explore? And then we're going to also ask um, and hopefully answer, how can we better use picture books in our classrooms? So obviously at the end, we'll hopefully have answered all of those. So um, even though this is a webinar, I really do want it to be interactive. So what I'm going to ask you to do is I have six questions for you, and I'm going to ask you to, to answer them true or false. So just if you'll if you'll share that, Martin. Okay, so go ahead. So the first one says, every colony allowed the enslavement of people, including states like New York, Pennsylvania, and Massachusetts. Mark that true or false. African Americans fought in every war as soldiers. Women worked outside the home beginning in the 1820s. Texas and California used to belong to Mexico. Segregation affected Latinx children in the US. And Thanksgiving celebrates pilgrims or separatists sharing a feast in friendship with the Wampanoag Nation. So now you get to decide if you were correct or not. So if you marked the first five as true, 
and the last one is false, then you get 100%. So if you want to show off, um, there you go, Tracy. In the chat, you can you can put down that you've got 100%. Um, and I just want to go through these a little bit because a lot of these questions, we don't know. Um, so if you think about which ones were you taught in elementary school and which ones were you taught in secondary school and which ones were you taught at university and maybe which were you never taught because what we know and what we're taught determines how we think about things. Um, so just to give you a little bit of information um, with um, women working outside the home, because a lot of people say, oh, no, they didn't do that until World War II. Actually, beginning in 1823, with the opening of the Lowell's factory, which were for textiles, between 1830 and 1860, women remained a key labor force and mill superintendents were paid to bring suitable young ladies to work there. As far as Texas and California, I have a, a friend who's a social studies scholar, and he always joked that his family didn't come to America, America came to him. He and his family have lived in the same area of Texas for many, many generations, but his family is now seen as Hispanic and outsiders, even though his family has been in that same area for hundreds of years. Um, as far as Thanksgiving, and we're gonna get into this a little bit more, but there's a great Smithsonian article from 2019 that talks about this myth. Um, the myth is that friendly Indians, and this is a quote from the Smithsonian, the myth is that friendly Indians, unidentified by tribe, welcome the pilgrims to America, teach them how to live in this new place, sit down to dinner with them and then disappear. Um, they hand America off to white people so that the white people can create a great nation dedicated to liberty, opportunity, and Christianity for the rest of the world. And obviously that's not true, but that is how we oftentimes see it taught in the classroom. And what we know is that the, the Thanksgiving feast that has been um, mythologized actually was a three-day um, treaty discussion that was not very friendly. Um, but in 1769, the descendants, there you go, thanks for pulling it up, Martin. Um, in 1769, a group of pilgrim descendants felt that their cultural authority was slipping away in New England. So they planted the seeds that the pilgrims were the fathers, um, mothers and fathers of America. And that's why we have that today. So I really want you to think about what we teach. Martin, if you'll go to the next slide, please. Whoops. Okay, there we go. Thanks. So, um, so I really want you to think about why we teach what we teach and what the research say about books in the classroom. So we know, especially in the elementary classroom, but also in middle school and high school, we have less time than we want. Um, in the elementary school, we may not ever have time to teach social studies directly. I teach teachers, my pre-service educators, they, many of them have never seen social studies taught directly in a classroom. And I'm guessing that some of you may be in the same position. So books end up being a great way to teach social studies, but we need to be careful about the books that we choose. So the book that's on here, um, yay, yay for Misty. Um, the, the book that's listed on here, it's called A Birthday Cake for George Washington. And this book was criticized when it came out, which was good because it, it um, the book suggests that the perks, benefits, and joy that Hercules, who was one of George Washington's enslaved people, um, that the perks, benefits, and joy that they could receive from working closely for a person of stature outweighs the context of enslavement. Even worse, Birthday Cake presents Hercules and his daughter as proud servants without juxtaposing their bondage to their owner or the institution of slavery. And that's from um, Teaching for Change. So Scholastic was very responsive. They took it off the market pretty quickly. 
but recognize that that book came out in 2016. So that's less than a decade ago. We were still creating books, and I'm sure that they, you know, they're being created today that really were not the types of books we want to share in the classroom that, that promote incorrect ideas. So <clears throat> what Chauncey Montesano suggests in her research is that we as teachers choose what we teach. And there are four ways that we teach. One of them is based on our own knowledges, bias, and perceived um, importance. So we can't teach what we don't know. And if we, for example, don't know about Hispanic segregation in schools, we certainly won't teach it. Um, we want to teach what's true, but we don't always know what's true. For example, um, teaching about Columbus. You know, Columbus discovered America. Um, that's not true. There are already people living here. He may have opened it up for European trade. But that's not as good of a story. It may not make us as comfortable. So we have to think about what we believe is true. Felicity is teaching what makes us happy. Um, it makes us feel good about ourselves, about our country, about the state. We love teaching Susan B. Anthony and how women earned the right to vote. But maybe we don't want to talk about the predecessors to Susan B. Anthony or about other things that were done to her that led up to the vote because it doesn't make us feel so good. And it was pretty ugly. And then sometimes we just teach things because they're fun. It's entertaining. Um, and my favorite one, I live in Pittsburgh right now, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And there is a true historical story about exploding bananas. And let me tell you, to third graders, there is nothing better than exploding bananas. Um, and just so all of you know this lovely story, because it's so fun. Um, a company used gas heaters to keep the bananas at a certain temperature so that they would ripen. And supposedly somebody turned on an electric fan and the spark ignited with the ethylene gas <coughs> lit out by the bananas and the whole factory exploded and literally bananas were raining down. And the fact that nobody got hurt um, makes it a great story to share. But we need to think about why we teach what we teach. So these are issues of selection. And we're going to come back to these in um, a few minutes. So we need to think about our selection because if we go to the next one. There we say, because um, books convey hidden curriculum. And what the hidden curriculum is, is they're the biases, expectations, norms, and beliefs that schools promote. So I want everyone to think of the your favorite chi children's book and if you want to put it in the chat so we can all um look at these books and think about them that would be great um but the children your favorite children's book that you read in the classroom that you have in your library that you um that you personally loved um and what i want you to think about is what do the families look like oh chronicles of narnia excellent right three kids no parents around they get to go off on ex explorations um the teachers march i don't know one natalie i don't know that one i'll have to check that one out um the two princesses so you have all of these great stories and then we have to ask what do families look like who is in charge what happened in history who is important in the story and who is not? And so um, you'll see on the screen, there's the um, Pete the Cat story of Thanksgiving, which love Pete the Cat. My kids love Pete the Cat. Um, very popular books, but the message in that picture is very, very different than the picture um, of We Are Grateful, um, written by Tracy Sorrell, who was raised in the Cherokee Nation. And so these could both be used at Thanksgiving, but they convey very, very different messages to kids. And those messages are part of that hidden curriculum. So um, common books that we use with our students, Junie B. Jones, Al Capone Does My Shirts. I don't know if you know any of these, Diary of a Wimpy Kid. They're all great books. Um, but they're all about white characters. And if you look at the characters, um, at the books that some of you listed, we have white middle-class characters. Um, Frog and Toad are friends. We have, we have animal 
animals, right? And yet frog and toad are definitely English gentlemen, the way they dress, the way they talk. Um, so we really have to think about who are we showing? Because the research says, and this is really key, the research suggests that who is seen in picture books is important. According to Adams in 2021 and Adam and Barack Pugh in 2020, only showing white people or even animals that are clearly white people convey that white people are the important ones. White kids then feel more important. Um, they see themselves everywhere. Kids of color, they feel less important and believe that they are less important in society. So we're helping kids to internalize both white kids and non-white kids. We're helping them to internalize this white supremacy that's already rampant in society. Same thing for women. Um, think about what women are doing in a lot of picture books. My daughter, um, who is now 20, but when she was in third grade, she told me that she wanted to be a boy. And I said, okay, why do you want to be a boy? And her reason was because boys do things and girls just watch. And that was the message she was getting from books and from school, even though all of her teachers up until that time had been female. If you'll go to the next one. So in elementary school, it's very, very hard to make sure that we are teaching the truth because the truth is huge. Um, we teach people, and I, I chose these people because these people are often taught in elementary school. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Martin Luther King, Helen Keller. Um, so when we talk about them, what do we teach? And what do we choose to teach about them? So with George Washington, we learn he was a general. We learn he was a president. Maybe we incorrectly learned that he had false, that he had wooden teeth. Okay, he did not have wooden teeth. Um, do we learn that he enslaved people? Do we learn that he wasn't always successful? Um, we know that early in his career, when the French Indian War had not quite begun at Fort Necessity, he had had to surrender to the French who surrounded him and his troops. So the first thing we need to know about people is people are complicated. Um, he was a hero, but he originally failed at war. He enslaved people during his lifetime, and he, but he freed the people who he enslaved after he died in his will but his wife, the people his wife enslaved were not free. So there's this complication in trying to discuss him. Um, example number two with Thomas Jefferson. When my son was in third grade, they read the who's who books. They had a biography project. Everybody had to read a who's who. They could dress up as the person if they wanted. They gave a presentation to the rest of third grade. My son read that Jefferson enslaved his own children whom he had had with his wife's enslaved half-sister, Sally Hemings. And Ben, my son, was appalled by the idea that the person who wrote all men are created equally, or all men are created equal, could simultaneously enslave his own children because they were born to an enslaved woman. So we had lots of really important and interesting conversations that were initiated by him. So the second thing we need to know is we need to contextualize not excuse slavery by any means. Slavery is and was wrong, but understanding the fullness of a situation helps us recognize the complexity and have these really deep conversations. So the third example is Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King is often spoken about as if he is the person who created and led the entire civil rights movement, as if everyone else was a footnote to his story. But instead, we need to recognize that he was part of a movement. Um, Edie, or Edgar Nixon, was the NAACP president after Montgomery. He was the one who bailed Rosa Parks out of jail after her refusal to get out of a seat. And, and um, Nixon was the one who convinced Rosa Parks to be the poster child for the bus boycott. But it was led by the Montgomery Improvement Association the head of whom was a 26-year-old unknown pastor named Martin Luther King. So that's where he gets his start. So putting him in context with other civil rights leaders show that we can all go further if we work together. But individuals are easier than movements. And the last one is with Helen Keller. And we can use Helen Keller as an amazing story of hope and perseverance and triumph. Um, we use this story to teach morals of perseverance and even hold her up as a poster child 
for um, overcoming our disabilities. But um, while the story explains how she learned to sign and communicate and that she went to college, it ends there. It doesn't talk about the fact that she became a a uh, political powerhouse in the socialist movement in America. Because a lot of people don't want to know that about Helen Keller. So in the um, in Congress, there is a uh, statue of Helen Keller, but it's this picture with her hand underneath the water. So the last thing we need to think about with this, and if you'll click this, Martin, um, is that we only tell the parts of the story that maybe we want students to know. And again, this deals with selection. So we each need to decide what we teach and how we teach and why we teach and what we teach. We can't just do it without thought. So now I wanna go into some activities. So the first one that I wanna to go to is wondering about pictures. And I love picture books. So I'm only gonna show you two because that's all that we really have time for, but um, there's a list that I know Martin is going to share with you that has a ton of picture books that I happen to use. Um, you can go onto lots of websites and find great picture books, and we'll get into that later on. But this is a book. Um, this first picture, or this first book, is um, called Encounter by Jane Yolen. It's illustrated by uh, David Shannon, who is brilliant. And this, uh, this activity can be done with students of all ages. So um, these were four pictures that students in the past, like my students um, and elementary students have been like, ooh, those pictures are weird. So the, um, the first two, the students really do not like the middle one where he's pinching his hand and the one in the middle where he's holding gold. They think that the one in the middle looks like a zombie hand. And the other one looks like he's possessed by gold. That's how kids describe this. But this story is told about the um, from a Taino perspective, um, the boy in the picture in the first and fourth picture, he is telling the story of when Europeans come to his island. And you're seeing the pictures through his eyes. And um, we read the story, but then I ask the kids, what do you think of the pictures? What is what is catching your attention and why? And how do, the, how do the pictures make you feel? And what did you notice? And these are the pictures that kids call out. They're like, ooh, that's weird, or that's upsetting, or that makes me feel this way. And then we as teachers can pull those themes and concepts and ideas to our students. For example, um, how do we see people when we have no knowledge of them? What are our assumptions? Um, what do we think is normal? What clothing is normal? Um, do we see people who are different as equal? And one of the things that my students, my elementary students have said in the past, they wonder why the Taino boy who's illustrating the story is so surprised how others look. Because many of the children eight years and younger don't realize that internet didn't exist, computers, TV, we didn't see other people. We were, we were isolated. So we can use picture books um, to really look at these pictures, but the kids are the ones who are determining what we discuss in the books. We're not asking what happened first, what happened second, what happened last, what does this word mean? We're really using the pictures and the children's questions and comments to guide their learning. So the second book I wanna share with you um, is Ruby Bridges. And I love this book because um, we know that it is factual and I'll show you the book that goes along with it. Um, but again, these are some of the pictures that my students look at. And what I love is that the students see and have questions that I would never have thought of. So in the first picture, and I don't know how many of you know Ruby Bridges, but Ruby Bridges was one of four little girls who were sent to um, integrate schools in New Orleans. And um, there were four girls. She was sent by herself. And then the three other little girls were sent to McDonough 19. And they were known as the McDonough Three. <coughs> And the only reason I even know that 
is at one time I, when I was asking the students, um, I'll, I'll get to that in one second, Donna. Um, one of the things that um, is really interesting is this, I didn't even think about this, but one of the students said to me, well, what happened to the other three girls? And I thought, oh, I don't know. Um, the picture in the middle about praying, why is she praying in church? And that led into this whole big conversation about um, the religion, like people's religions and the power of the church during the civil rights movement, et cetera. And then in the last picture, why is she sitting by herself? Where is everybody else? What did other, where did the white kids go who weren't in schools? Um, the other thing that was asked, and again, not my question, because I wouldn't have thought of this because I'm not eight. Um, why were only girls chosen? Where, why weren't any little boys chosen? And I thought, wow, that's pretty, um, pretty crazy. So if you go to the next slide, there's also um, a nonfiction version by Ruby Bridges herself. And these are the actual photos. And the, the content in this is much higher and I wouldn't use it with an elementary class per se, but showing the pictures. Because one of the things that we know um, from Keith Barton's research about pictures and elementary children is that when kids see drawings, they think it's from long ago or it's fiction. And if it's black and white pictures, then it's real, but it's long ago. So you can show very young, chil very young children pictures with computers in them that are with black and white, and they'll think that they were long ago computers. Um, but showing the actual pictures of what happened make this very real to, um, to a lot of students. So if we go to the next slide. So I wanna reflect a little bit on this activity because when we talk about inquiry, we're talking about children leading and asking questions. So it's self-directed in that um, it is centered around students' voices and their questions. It's not about reading a story and having them give us a right answer. It promotes curiosity and allows the students to ask questions um, that are important to them. And they pick what's meaningful and their background or lack thereof really guides the discussion. The, um, the second part is if you have the students discussing a book um, in a group, um, then their, the material is socially constructed. Kids are sharing their views and their experiences. They see themselves, they see others. They learn that not everyone lives the same shared experiences. Maybe someone sees that picture and goes, oh, I go to church and someone else says, oh, I go to synagogue and someone says, I don't go to any place. Um, they share openly in these discussions and they learn that there's many different ways to live. And that's a pretty powerful social studies theme. Um, relatedly, questions arise naturally. They ask each other, they ask you, they want your take on things. So how many times has an elementary teacher said to you, hey, teacher, did you know? And, and they tell you something about another kid's life. Like, um, I had a kid say to me one time, hey, Miss Marks, did you know that Eric has eight siblings? And what they're waiting for is your reaction to tell them how to respond because you're socializing them. If you say, wow, that's a lot of kids in a household, the kid will internalize that differently than, wow, that must be so much fun to have so many people in the house to play with all the time. So the bottom line is that kids are learning naturally. And the graphic on the bottom um, comes from Bishop in the 1990s, who talked about the fact that women are, that children need books as mirrors, as windows, and as doors. Um, we need kids to be able to see themselves, to see each other, and to be able to walk through the doors to make those connections for themselves and other people. You'll go to the next slide. So um, this is Grant Lee and Swan's um, inquiry design um, model for, um, for inquiry. And I know that Martin is going to send out the link for that. Um, 
there are a lot of different um, ways to design inquiry. This is one. Um, just to give a, a shout out to NCSS, there is a really great elementary model for um, inquiry in the social studies in the young learner, January, February, 2018. So you can find that in their archives. Um, but with, with this particular form, it can be uh, teacher designed or student led. Teachers can come up with questions and set the kids off for exploration or the students can read and explore and then decide on questions. Either way, they're doing more than just answering yes, no, they're actually critically thinking about things. And one of the things that I love about inquiry is that it focuses on children's curiosity and desire to know. So often kids are so excited about school when they start. And then by third grade, I hate school because their natural curiosity has gotten pushed down. So this allows them to ask and to explore and to go. And I have this, um, I have this quote about following questions down the rabbit hole because it was how one of my students explained it when he finally understood inquiry. He said to me, it's like when you have a question that you want to know and you go on the internet and you just keep following site after site, the original question may or may not have already been answered, but you want more information. You want to learn more and it has grown or changed. And the next thing you know, three hours has passed and all you can do is think, wow, that was so interesting. <clears throat> so um, again, we're not testing students, we're asking them to think about things. So we could use um, a variety of different books. If we go to the next slide. So we could use a number of different books and have them make connections to this. So for example, um, these are just an example of four books that all focus on the Underground Railroad. So in the C3 framework, um, and um, if you're part of NCSS, the C3 framework has competencies that students should know, um, or you could use your state standards. Um, the C3 standards that I might use for this might be create and use chronological sequence of related events to compare developments that happened at the same time or generate questions about individuals and groups who have shaped significant historical changes and continuities, or identify evidence that draws information from multiple sources in response to compelling questions. So all of those or any of those might go on this. And then the compelling question might be, the big question is what do we know and how do we know about the Underground Railroad? It's a pretty typical thing that we teach in elementary school. And so this, the idea of staging the question is how do we pull the kids in? How do we get the students to want to join in? So it might be something like, we've been talking about the Underground Railroad a little bit, but it's important to know that it wasn't the same for everyone. So I have some stories for you to read. Um, and what you want to ask is, what do we know and how do we know about the Underground Railroad? And then you can say to the kids, what supporting questions do we need to ask before we can even jump into that? And so these are some of the questions that they might come up with. These might be our, um, our sources. And then the answers that the kids are giving you are their formative, um, their formative tasks. They might be writing about them. They might be you know, making little notes, drawing pictures, depending on the age. They might be working in groups and having conversations but they're able to then pull things together on their own. Um, one of the questions that I got, which I loved, was um, what happened to the people who ran south? We know that everybody didn't run north, didn't make sense. What happened to people who ran south? What happened to people who ran west? And why don't we have those stories written down in the same way? Um, and the kids' questions take us so much deeper in ways that we may never have even um, thought of or, con or um, considered. And that's really the beauty of inquiry. So if we can go to the next one. 
So this is, um, I don't know how many of you have seen the Critical Media Literacy Framework. This was by Kellner and Shane, 2019. And these are questions we can ask ourselves about the books that we have and read in our classrooms. And many of these questions go back to issues of selection and how other people who are creating the media um, uh, made their decisions as well. So who are the possible people who made choices that helped with this text? Um, how is this constructed and delivered? <coughs> Excuse me. How could this be understood differently? What values, points of view, and ideologies are representative or missing? Why was this what was created and shared? And whom does this advantage or disadvantage? So these are questions we can ask ourselves. And if you're teaching older kids, they can actually ask these and answer these themselves. So if you'll go to the next one, please. So um, I want to leave you with some, um, some ideas, um, with some final ideas. The first one is this idea that democracy is not neutral. Um, Stephen Camicia and Ryan Knowles wrote, wrote a really thought-provoking book um, called Education for Democracy, A Renewed Approach to Civic Inquiries, for social justice. And one of the things that they say is basically democracy is not new, neutral. And I share this because most of us do not like to make waves. Okay, Some of you are like, yes, let's make waves. But a lot of people in elementary ed, they don't want to upset parents. Um, I know that at the very beginning, a number of you were like, how do we teach? Um, how do we teach with all these laws about CRT? How do we teach diversity in this uh, increasingly polarized environment? And for many educators, we want to remain neutral in these culture wars that are going on. Um, but many of you may, and many of you may be in situations like me at one of our um, local districts. Um, one of the board, school board members, complained about a book called Everyone is Welcome. And I want you to think about that. Everyone is welcome. And he complained about this. And it was read in kindergarten. It was read to the morning class. And it was read to the afternoon class in that first week of orientation. And he said, and I quote, because it became an article in the newspaper, because it was so contentious. He said, the title of the book is All Are Welcome. And the book is about inclusivity, including immigrants but it neglects to differentiate between legal immigration and foreign invaders. And he also went on to complain because there are same sex couples with children in the book. So my view of the book, yep, it does not differentiate between legal immigrants and undocumented immigrants. And yes, there are same sex couples with children in the book. Um, although to be fair, I had read that book a number of times and I had to go back and really, really look carefully to find them. But the main point is this, we have those kids in our classrooms and they should not have to feel like they are invisible. They should not have to hide who they are and they should not have to hide who their families are. They are not second rate children. So we ought to be able to welcome everyone. So we cannot be neutral in the books we read. There is no neutrality. We either are inclusive and allow children to have mirrors and windows and doors, or we say that only certain children deserve to be seen. Choosing, and it is a choice, choosing to be inclusive for all of our students and helping students in all of our white classes, all of our black classes, our Latino classes, our Arab classes, to see others and themselves positively in worthwhile ways and important roles makes a difference. And the research bears that up. Um, I can tell you from a personal perspective, um, as a Jewish kid growing up, I really didn't know that there were Jews in the United States um, until 1900s, right? When all the immigrants come and then you hear about the Holocaust. That's all I was ever told. So when I was in high school, I learned about Chaim Solomon and I read the letters from George Washington to the Jewish congregation in Rhode Island. And it made me feel like I was actually part of the story. I was part of the American fabric. I wasn't just an extra or an add on later on. So all this to say, so similarly people of color need to hear about their stories and not just about enslavement or racism or hate. 
um, one of my friends who is a teacher in an almost entirely um, African-American school, she always tells her students that they are, she calls them the young kings and queens of African descent, because she says your ancestors were the kings and queens in Africa who were taken here. And the kids have a completely different feel because of how they view their, their past. So the words that we use change how the kids see themselves. So all this to say, we need to show people, and I mean all people, um, to children. Um, everyday diversity is important. So the, the books that I have on here, Kitchen Dance is such a lovely book. Um, I don't know if all of you know it. It's just, it's about a family being silly. Most families I know are silly at some points. It's great to see just everyday diversity. The other book um, is called Chibi, A True Story from Japan. And I love this book because um, it's the it's a true story about um, this duck who has ducklings and basically traffic comes to a stop and everything else. It reminds me very much of the very old book, um, Wait, Make Way for Ducky. But when my students looked at this and we looked at the pictures and what do you wonder about, they knew it was set in Japan. But they looked at the picture on the left and they're like, but they're wearing regular clothes. And I said to them, what do you think they wear in Japan? And they had only seen the stereotypical pictures of like um, silk and kimonos and that type of thing. And so this made them completely wonder about people in Japan now and why they didn't have that. So everyday diversity is really important because it normalizes. Um, and um, we need to be reading diverse books all of the time, not just Black History Month, Women's History Month, Latino History Month, Native American History Month. Um, American history really needs to be for everyone. And if you don't know where to start, and I think that most people who are here, based on what you've been posting, are pretty, pretty knowledgeable but um, but if if you don't know where to start, um, and that's that's okay. Everybody has to start someplace. Um, on the bottom, there's some pictures of awards. Um, most people who are in elementary ed know the Coldicots. It's a staple of elementary literature that's given for the most distinguished American picture books for children. Um, other awards that you should know um, that you can look for are the Pura Belpre Awards. Um, those are the ones that best portray, affirm, and celebrate the Latino cultural experience, the Coretta Scott King Awards that demonstrate an appreciation for African-American culture and universal human values, the Mildred Batchelder Awards uh, for books that are published in another language other than English and then translated, um, the Schneider Family Book Awards that embody an artistic expression of the disability experience, the Stonewall Book Award, books relating to the GLBT experience, and there are a lot more. Um, Native American, Arab American, Asian Pacific American, feminist, female focused, Jewish, race relations, etc. So look up the award, the award winning books um, for whatever grade level you're teaching and you're going to find some really spectacular books. Um, and the bottom line that I want you to walk away with today is that using diverse books and allowing children's questions and curiosity to lead the way will allow them to learn more, to stay curious, to be exposed to them, that to their own possibilities, to others, and that it helps promote true democracy and equality. So if you want to go to the last one. So that's that's me. If you have any questions or comments, I'm always happy to get emails. So um, Martin, I guess it's back to you. Oops, you're muted, Martin. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Melissa. One thing that um, we had some questions in the chat, so I'll, I'll send those to you. But one of the things that you, um, you noticed was that in the chat, there's a pretty good discussion going on and a lot of people probably have a lot of um, good recommendations themselves for books. So I would like to open up the chat too, is right now as we, when we, as we move on and I'm gonna ask Melissa some of the questions that have been posed, how about we share, you share in the chat your favorite books for 
um, that that meet the criteria that Melissa has been talking about that you use in your classrooms. Um, that would be wonderful. Or any other resources, Melissa shared some of the award-winning win, award organizations that you could go to and find out. Do you have any specific lists that you rely on when you look for diverse books in your classroom? Please share them in the chat um, right now. And then, um, Melissa, I don't know if you had a chance to um, to see some um, some of the Esperanza Rising. Oh, this, this is going to be such a great list that I will put this list in the blog post. But um, I think it was Linda who talked about, who added an interesting um, dimension to mirrors, windows, and doors in that she said that she works with the offices of Indian education and they also suggest adding curtains to that. I read window. that. I, I love that. Yeah. Yes. One of one of the things that's really, I think it's hard. So I'll I'll give you a funny story. Um, it's embarrassing, but it's kind of funny. So um, when I taught eighth grade, I I believe that you can't talk about the American colonial experience without talking about religions, because different groups came and settled, etc. And so um, I said to my students, look. <coughs> You know, I, I am not the, the knowledge holder of all things. If you, if I get something wrong about the sect in your church, please let me know. But I didn't enunciate the word sects well enough. And I said, you know, about sex in your church. And this one girl who was very religious, she raised her hand and she said, Miss Marks, we don't have sex in my church. And and so, number one, we have to be very careful about how we phrase things, but also there are pieces of knowledge that not only do we not share, but also we don't know how to share. Hmm. Um, and when we're talking about kids, especially elementary kids, I would say anyone under eighth grade, there are some really big concepts about beliefs and belief systems and families that they're not always for public consumption. And so I think I think it's really important to um, to know your students. I, I think that's true for any and every, um, oh, I love this list. Um, is there a way, Martin, for us to like download this list and, and share this out? Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll I get a um, transcript of the chat. And so I'll put the recommendations in the blog post when I send it out. Great. But, but back to the question about curtains, I think um, I also think it's really important not to, I think it's important to make sure that a child is never the spokesperson for an entire group. Um, we cannot be the token um, because my lived experience as a woman does not speak for the experience of all women. Um, and that's true for anybody in your class. So we just have to be very careful to make sure that we're focused on like a single lived experience with our students and that they are not they are not responsible to be the spokesperson for everybody. Yeah, a couple of the people in the in the chat and and echoed the idea of that you really got to at the end that it's very important that we show. Uh, we represent diverse books in ordinary ways. And mm -hmm. that it is that, that's why the, um, was it the family dancing? The, the, that, that there is, that it's not always on the same theme, that it's not always about, about struggle, even though that's an right. important part of the history, that n normalizing um, is really, really important. Um, and we had a lot of people that echoed that in the, in the chat as well. Um, one of the things that I do at the end of uh, webinars, Melissa, and I'm kind of springing on you on this is, uh, but first uh, is ask people what they're really excited about. What is something that they're reading that they're jazzed about or that um, they're into that's really exciting that's, um, it doesn't have to be related to necessarily the, the webinar topic. So I'll give you a second to think about like the books on your nightstand that you're really excited about. But first, I do want to ask you, you are actually in Chicago right now and presenting on research that is related to this 
uh, topic as well. Can you talk a little bit about the research component that goes along with this topic? I'm in Chicago and the research that I'm doing right now with, with one of my colleagues is about how we get new teachers um, and I know somebody had said in the in the um, way way at the very beginning, as far as what they wanted for webinars, is how do we get elementary teachers excited for social studies? And what I started to look at about five years ago was how do we get um, social studies into the elementary classroom at all? Because it's it's in in Pennsylvania, it's the one that's cut. There's no time. There's no reason. So. We have to integrate um, social studies into the language arts. And then it kind of morphed into trying to make sure that different perspectives were in there. So we're doing research right now where our students look at the, the um, it used to be teaching for tolerance, it's now learning for justice, and they have diversity standards. And those are great, so um, I'll make sure that you get a link for that, the um, diversity standards. But they have to look at those and choose a book that they consider diverse, whatever that means to them. And they do a huge project in their elementary class, their, I'm sorry, their elementary language arts class, and then um, their junior year and then their senior year with me, they do one, they do a continuation focused on social studies. And what we're trying to find out is, do they actually bring them into the into the schools? Do they have a more positive attitude towards, towards using these in the classroom? And um, what we're finding, and I'm presenting this tomorrow, um, is first of all, our students are becoming less prejudiced and they write that. You know, I come from a small town, um, I realize in looking at all this diversity and these diverse books and the diverse competence that my schooling and my background has left me with very narrow, very narrow perspectives. And, and this project has helped me like be more aware. So that, that in itself is really cool. But, um, but one of the, the, the presentation that I'm doing um, is actually called, how can you be the hero of your own story? And the, and the idea that one of the students wrote was that if you never see yourself in school, how can you be the hero of your own story? And I think that's a really powerful perspective. So, um, and what we found is that once pre-service teachers are more comfortable with these books and they've actually had to work with them and, and do different activities with them for their students, they're really excited to bring them in. Hey, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. And Melissa, a big thank you to you for joining us today. Everybody take care. Thank you so much.